Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Okay, so we've we've kind of walked through your resume, and you can see that you have a vast array of experiences at different levels of the arts in a variety of, uh, of ways, which <laughs> apparently has qualified you to direct this program. But I want to transition now. I want to transition into it, with with kind of this question, which will sound odd, but I hope it it it, it makes the point. And that is, and I'm gonna have a little fun with this. What in heaven's name are you doing with a media arts program at a seminary? I mean, normally, <laughs> normally you don't put those things together. So, yeah. so, so, explain the rationale for for how you see that connecting to someone who would come for theological training. I think that our world has opened up so much for through the influence of the arts in the secular environment that to ignore that opportunity is to abrogate our responsibility to reach the world with every tool that we have available. So this is a huge area in the public square. Enormous. Yeah, there is nothing that influences culture that influences culture more than film. Mm-hmm. And in film, the West Coast, LA mm-hmm. is is a a, a media, it's a media reflector. I mean a, a cultural reflector and it's also a cultural Former. In fact, in fact, I, I would say that the media, uh, and particularly the arts, and particularly the film and, and visual media, uh, is very much like culture. It both uh, it both generates meaning and it acts on us to create meaning in how we look at the world. You know, that's a, that's a great way of putting it. I, I believe that there is a, I believe that there is there is a. a at the base of the philosophy that I bring to the media arts program here and to the department is an understanding of the difference between what the world can offer and what we can offer in the arts. The world, the best that the world can do to inspire and motivate is, I think, reflected in Shakespeare's, uh, has, when he has Hamlet give the instructions to the, uh, the lead player when they're doing uh, the death of Gonzago uh, in Hamlet, he says uh, to speak the lines as I taught you trippingly upon the tongue and, and, and hold a mirror up to nature. Uh, mm-hmm. those, are, those are Hamlet's instructions. Hold a mirror up to nature. Be real. Mm-hmm. Don't saw the air too much, he says. Mm-hmm. You know, don't, don't overdo it. Mm-hmm. Just be real. Just hold a mirror up to nature. And I think that most artists that are secular and haven't had the, the joy of knowing Christ personally or haven't been challenged in this area in their, in their Christian walk, that their goal is to be real. It's reality. It's to uh, it's to show the world, mirror back to the world, something that is authentic and not fake. But we have the we see deeper and are able to offer a perspective on reality that extends beyond just the appearance of the world. And it's summed up, I think, in the way that Jesus first, when Jesus first greeted Peter, and he said, "Here comes Peter," and he said, "Okay, your name is Simon." But you're going to be Rocky. You're mm-hmm. going to be Peter. Mm-hmm. He didn't just take Peter for who he was, and then reflect back to him. Okay, this is who you are. He he. Rather than than using a mirror, he opened a window into heaven. Yeah, and I said. I I think the window or the mirror picture actually doesn't say, in some ways, enough about what media does yeah. because media not only reflects what's there or attempts to reflect what's there and gets and and tries to get us in touch with with. Why it's there to a certain degree, mm-hmm. but it also can project a different kind of world and get us to think about possibilities for a different kind of world. And in doing that, it actually can shape meaning and create meaning as opposed to merely reflecting it. Isn't that absolutely? Yeah. In, in Monroe's motivated sequence in rhetoric, you find this uh, this projection of an image, this this imagining what the world would be like if we see it in Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech mm-hmm. uh, on the Mall mm-hmm. uh, when he said, "I see." There little, it is with words. It's it, yeah. Yeah. But but words that paint a picture That's right. of a reality that isn't yet but could be if we embrace the kind of change that we need to embrace. You know, and I, I think that this is this is getting at the core of why I wanted to do this particular segment because when, I think when most people think of the arts, 
they take a I'll, I'll say, they take a laid back view of the arts. Here's the laid back view. The laid back view of the arts is I'm there to be entertained. I'm mm-hmm. there to be distracted from the normal noise of life. And so I go to an art museum and just stare at the beauty of the pictures or contemplate, you know, the forms of modern art. Or I um, or I go to a film so I can just escape my world yeah. and think they use it as an aesthetic for the pain of a exactly busy life. Exactly right, and and and, yeah. it, and and they think of arts. You know, it's it's the arts and entertainment network, in which the E is the longer word, mm-hmm. and so so they think of entertainment rather than the artistic side of it. But most people who are artists, I find, aren't in it. I say merely to entertain, they're in it for a much more profound kind of reason. Mm-hmm. And that's why they connect to it. And that's actually, they have a sense of mission, just like a journalist has a sense of mission uh, in terms of what it is that, you know, the journalist is trying to to present and, and help people understand what's going on in the public square. An artist is really trying to present and help people understand either what's going on in life or what could go on in life. Mm-hmm. It's an inv- it's, I think it's an invitation to participation uh, rather than allow I, – I think one of the things I tell my students is that we cannot allow our audiences, our congregations, the luxury of observation. If we allow them to sit back and watch us perform, watch us worship and applaud and say, oh, what a great, what a great job you did, mm-hmm. that's not worship mm-hmm. and that's not participation. My, my invitation through my art – whatever form it's in, is to engage the observer or the listener or the viewer in such a way that they are drawn into a participatory experience, an encounter with Jesus Christ, so that they can then move forward and develop that relationship. It's never just to entertain. It is always an invitation to participation. Now, now this – this again goes in the direction that, that I wanted to pursue with you, and that is, someone comes to your program and they decide I'm going to be uh, I'm going to major in presentation. I'm going to be an actor, mm-hmm. um, but I'm not going to act in the church. Okay, I'm going to go out and try and be an actor. What challenge exists for a Christian person who moves out into the public square as an artist? Boy, that's a great question, and and it's not a, there's not a simple answer to it. Uh, ask Naima Let. Uh, Naima was our first graduate in the program back in 2005. She went to Hollywood. She's at uh, she and her husband Kevin are dear friends of ours. Uh, Let's Rise dot com, I believe it is. L e t t s Rise dot com is her uh, URL. Uh, she. Uh, she went out and had been working with Max McLean for years as an actress. Now, who's Max Ma- McLean, just for people who don't know? Max runs the Fellowship for the Performing Arts up in – he just moved to Manhattan. He was in New Jersey, and I believe that his offices are in Manhattan now. Max mm-hmm. goes out and, and, and does a, a masterful job – we've had him in chapel here mm-hmm. – of, of uh, presenting Bible books and Bible characters and characters that are not biblical. His current production is uh, C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters, which yeah, just Yeah, I think he's at Dallas. Redeemer's Presbyterian Church in, in New York City now and, mm-hmm. and yep, working with he them. Is. Yeah. He is with Mako Fujimura, yeah. who is another brilliant artist. Mako right. goes to uh, Redeemer, uh, mm-hmm. and both of them are doing great. Well, uh, she was, Naima, was in Max's company. Okay. She came down to seminary. Got company, her, you mean his artistic company? His artistic company, sorry, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. His artistic company came down here to DTS, got the training in the program, emerged, went out to they, – they had a calling to go out to West LA, to West Hollywood, and – and plugged into the community out there. She auditioned for a role in in uh, remember the film Benjamin Button. Uh, mm-hmm. She auditioned for a role, got a, a speaking role in that right off the bat. Uh, she had a, a, a she has a wonderful witness out there and is is training uh, people in the arts and and ministering to people just one on one, just doing a and in in groups doing a a, a really excellent job out there. Uh, so. She she had the challenge of working in a very high end movie industry secular environment, maintaining her Christian witness while she's playing a not desirable character mm-hmm. in Benjamin Button, and and trying to walk that tightrope between aesthetic integrity and 
and personal integrity, and she's she's done a great job of maintaining that balance. And that's what we we try to. That's why it's so important to understand what the biblical and theological bases are for the decisions that you make as an actor, as an artist. Mm -hmm. How do you know whether or not you're going to participate in a particular scene? If a particular scene calls on me to violate my personal ethics, then I don't do the scene. If it if it is a scene that is that allows for the development of an evil character, but stays within the bounds of my personal ethics in terms of performance uh, disciplines, then yes, I'll do, somebody has to play Judas. Right. I mean, you yeah. if you're going to reflect what the world is, it's, and you live in a in a in a world that has all kinds of things going on, you've got all kinds of things that can be portrayed. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But you come to a line. There's a line, and for every artist, they have to decide. That's not an arbitrarily drawn line. Right. They have to decide what they believe is most consistent with a with a biblical witness that glorifies the Lord. Now, I can glorify the Lord by playing a bad character because I'm being true to that character, mm -hmm. but the way that I play that bad character is what's up for grabs. Mm -hmm. So there are certain things that personally that uh, another actor may feel comfortable with that I won't say. There mm -hmm. are certain things that I won't do mm -hmm. uh, that, I've, in my opinion, for me, that would mean crossing the line into an area that would violate my own my own uh, my own beliefs in and integrity. I just couldn't do that. Okay. Well, the actor. Uh, it, I'm gonna kind of draw this out as a narrative. The actor uh, works with a script that has been given to them in one way or another. Uh -huh. So they have the decision about how to follow through on on what that script script is and how to present that script that they have. That's the actor side of it. Mm -hmm. But then there's the writer side of it as well. And the writer side of it is is that you know people write scripts that end up being uh, the artistic presentations that we that we see um, less often that we hear, but often that we see. And I've I've had meetings uh, when I've gone out. To, we we both have been at Talbot Biola numerous times, and uh, I've had meetings while I've been out there with scriptwriters who live in L.A. and mm -hmm. who are writing materials and who are wrestling with being a Christian on the one hand and yet writing for the everyday um, – for the everyday public square in a in a in a purely secular business context, talk about the challenges of being not an actor but a writer who who supplies the stories that get that we see. Some of the stories that are the most success, successful are built on a a real simple formula that's a that some people out in L.A. call a meta narrative. Some people call a monomythic cycle. Ooh, um, that's they a were, big word. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was. Um, uh, back, if you, if you push it back, you go back to guys like Joseph Camp. Campbell, a preeminent mythologist in in our in the last century. Sure, I mean he's written books on on comparative religion that are. That's important. right. Yeah. yeah, hero with a thousand faces yeah. and and so on. And he uh, he had a profound influence on Northrop Frye, who was a contemporary of his mm -hmm. and uh, a man who wrote in in hermeneutics and literary critical analysis. That's right. And they uh, uh, together they they formulated a series of ideal and unideal experiences that were archetypal. If you glean from those and By archetypal, elements, what do you mean? I'm going to have you define technical good, terms. Good, yeah. It's, uh, it would be a, a paradigm or a model mm -hmm. that, that works transculturally, transtemporally from one age to the next, from one culture to the next. These symbols or archetypes are function to elicit a kind of a – of a, of a positive or negative response, almost a visceral response on the part of the viewing or reading audience. So if we talk about the flood, okay, then mm -hmm. we're in an archetype about, about – Floods are bad. Yeah, that's right. So floods are bad. If flood, if I see flood, mm -hmm. then I'm saying, okay, something bad is going on here. Something uh, bad uh, uh, a, a An archetype that has become uh, – how can I say – has become ambiguous in our time is the rainbow. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the cross. Yes, the cross, it depends on context. Yeah. In one context, the rainbow is a sign of God's deliverance and his promise never to uh, flood the world, again, never to destroy the world by water. In another context, it's uh, My Little Pony. Mm -hmm. And, well, 
you have to you have to determine how it's being used and what it is. Oh, you've been nice by the way you've handled the rainbow. But anyway, we'll let that go. <laughs> <laughs> there are other associations that That's take right. on different characters. That's right. Uh, but also in the, in in terms of if, if you look at the cross in one context, it's a symbol of death and pain and suffering and and horror. And in another context, the empty cross in particular is a sign of victory. Mm-hmm. So it depends on how where the archetype is placed. If you take these I, these archetypes of the ideal and the unideal experience, mm-hmm. and you put them into a framework, a structure of movement that is that that is a narrative. Mm-hmm. So this is plot and other things like that. A kind of a plot, yeah, yes. Yeah. It is what some people have called a monomythic structure. Mono myth would myth has nothing to do with truth claims. It only has to do with the characters and the action associated with those characters in a particular narrative flow. Uh, so you can have uh, you can have mythic structure in true documents. So it it, it it it's a fancy word in some ways. I'm going to try and simplify this. It's a sam- uh, fancy word in some ways for for. Uh, for fiction, but a fiction that's designed to be real in some way. It's designed to be to reflect reality yeah. and to use comp- and, and it doesn't it doesn't have to be true, but it could be true. And mm-hmm. it uses these components, these archetypes archetypes of the ideal and the unideal experience, in a way that is going to give the reader almost uh, subconscious cues as to when the story is supposed to move. So, for example, if you took the Bible as a whole, right. the Garden of Eden is an archetype of the ideal experience. Right. Gardens as a whole are archetypes of the ideal experience. So it's a good symbol. It's a good starting place. Right. Just so happens, that's where things started, yeah. in a literal Garden of Eden. But it's not good for very long before a snake shows up and upsets the apple cart, so to speak. That transitional device is tragic. Mm -hmm. That transitional device revolves around a decision that's made to disobey. That transitional device carries the action down into an unideal world where people are left without hope. Adam and Eve are left without hope until the Lord shows up and promises to restore them based on their obedience. They come back up. The ultimate comic event in all of human history is the resurrection. So you've got... Ideal comic world. in what sense? Comic, not in, um, excuse me, not in a ha ha, not in a, yeah. a laughing sense, but in a resolution sense, in a Dantean sense. When Dante wrote the Divine Comedy, he wasn't laughing a lot. Mm-hmm. He he was saying there is a problem, there's a tragic problem in human history called sin mm-hmm. that will wind you up in hell unless there is an intervention, mm-hmm. and that intervention is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As a result of that, you can experience paradiso, mm-hmm. paradise. Mm-hmm. You get to come back to the world that you abandoned, but it's better. It's like what Tolkien did in The Hobbit. Mm-hmm. Wait, what's the subtitle for The Hobbit, remember? No, I don't remember. It's there and back again. Mm. It's a cycle. Yeah. You leave Hobbiton, mm-hmm. which is an ideal environment. Right. And you go to Mordor, mm-hmm. which is the worst possible environment, hellish environment, mm-hmm. filled with fire. And then you come back to Hobbiton with the knowledge that the 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 trip that you took accomplished a great deal. You conquered evil, and you come back, and the environment that you left is transformed so by that So comic is, resol- is resolutory. Resol- resolution yeah. is what we're talking about when we talk about comic. Okay. Right. Okay. So so I'm a writer. Back to my original question. Mm-hmm. I'm a writer, and I have this challenge of really presenting, if I can – I'm going to try and boil down what you've done, the, the story of the tensions of life. Um, yeah, you don't have conflict, you don't have that's drama, right. you don't Exa- have a story. Exactly. So, so the, uh, the the story of the tensions of life that somehow get worked out in an either positive direction, which I'm taking as your comic resolution, mm-hmm. or a tragic direction, which I take it as a is a neg- negative negative resolution. Okay, negative. Mm-hmm. And 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 the writer is designed the writer is attempting to pull people into not just the story to entertain them but if it's a good story it's a it's a story that's designed to lead them into some kind of reflection isn't that isn't that part of the goal yes yes it's the uh, some people will describe the turning point in a story as the gospel element it's the aha it's the it's the uh, the recognition in classic terms it's the anagnorisis this uh, this sudden awareness of a fatal flaw 
and how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Uh, They have spent most of the story following rabbit trails that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, by God's grace, they discover an answer, and that answer is the gospel, so to speak, loosely defined, that enables the person to to come out of the story in a good way, or the the person, the protagonist, can ignore that message, mm-hmm. and and you have a tragedy, like in the case of Samson. Mm-hmm. Samson is a tragedy. Even I would make an argument that the story of King David is a tragedy. Mm-hmm. The last words he utters are, you know. Don't let his head go down to the grave. You know, he's, 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 make <laughs> yeah. it a bloody end. Yeah. You know, he's, he's the godfather calling yeah. for the death of Joy. Uh, so I think that that not all not all stories end well, but they don't end well based upon the the lack of the protagonist and the hero. And they're not always the same thing. The um, the protagonist and the hero are not always the same. Sometimes they're split. Their, their willingness to, to submit to an authority or a, a piece of knowledge or an event that would have rescued them. If they say no, you've got tragedy. If they say yes, you've got comedy. It's summed up in a, in a really good book called The Moral Premise. Hmm. Uh, the Moral Premise was, uh, was put together a, a few years ago uh, by Stanley Williams. He is the uh, script doctor for Will Smith, and uh, Stanley is a believer and a great guy. He worked with one of my students uh, in a, mm. an independent project. His contention that he proves in this book is that every major motion picture that has made money follows a moral premise. It has a moral spine. So he, so he, uh, in the book, does he just try to take some of them and tell you what the premise is? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And you can That'd go online and, and look at it and see uh, uh, video downloads of uh, of clips where he illustrates. Okay, here's the turning point. Here's where the character accepted the invitation or denied the invitation. Join us next week for part three of the Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.